Good afternoon. I uh, want to welcome everybody to, uh, to New America. I'm Mark Schmidt. I'm the director of the political reform program here. And I'm delighted to have, uh, have you all here for this discussion of uh, wh what we're calling beyond corruption and looking at some different ways of, of thinking about uh, issues of money and politics. We're going to have a kind of three-part uh, event here today, I guess. The, uh, uh, for the first part, we'll be, we're joined by uh, Congressman John Sarbanes, who'll make a few remarks about the issue, and I'll introduce him in a minute. Uh, and then we'll move into uh, a kind of panel discussion uh, that will be led by Larry Norton of the Brennan Center for, for Justice, which is a co-sponsor of this, of this event, uh, with, uh, with the basic topic being some of the issues that I've raised in, the, in this paper that's out, out front, uh, called political opportunity, trying to trying to uh, bring up some new ways to, to talk about these issues, uh, and w and we're joined for that by Congressman Sarbanes and also uh, by Ann Ravel from the uh, who's the chair of the Federal Election Commission, uh, and I think both what's interesting about this is that uh, both. Both Anne and Congressman Sarbanes are rel well, and John are, are relatively new uh, voices on this issue in the le at the federal level, and and bringing some new uh, some new perspectives both in their in their individual presence and and in their ideas. Uh, Congressman Sarbanes has represented the third district of Maryland uh, since 2007. Uh, it's a district that includes, I think, parts of four different uh, different counties, and and he lives in Towson. He's a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee and the uh, subcommittee on health of the. Uh, of the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is a, a pretty powerful uh, 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 place to be, and he's really been an incredible leader on 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 this issue in particular, uh, bringing together a number of ideas that 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 took the form of the Government for the People Act, Governed by the People Act uh, last year, which had I think I think 100 and, uh, 140 co-sponsors, 160, but yeah, 100. That's well. You stay. That's the danger of starting. You, you do have to start from scratch. But uh, that's that. That is a no joke level of of support for for a set of ideas that really draw on a lot of creativity, uh, both you know in his, both uh, in Congress, but also drawing on things that are beginning to we're beginning to see work at the at the state level and and the and the and the municipal level. So it's an exciting opportunity. Uh, Congressman Sarbanes is a graduate of Princeton and Harvard Law School, and uh, we're really, I'm really thrilled to have his his uh, presence on this issue, and I'm looking forward to his his remarks this afternoon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. I thank Mark and the New America Foundation. I'm a big fan of the work of this uh, foundation, and I want to thank Ann Ravel for being here. We had an at times. Um, inspiring and at times dispiriting conversation in my office a while back about uh, the, the battles that are underway. Um, and I certainly want to thank the Brennan Center for the work that they do and Larry Norton. It's um, great to be here uh, with you. So I want to start um, this conversation on money and politics and what we can do to address it by, I guess, posing the question of whether um, campaign finance reform, which is really the center of the solution to the problem, is this, is this a tree falling in the woods that nobody is going to hear? And I believe deeply that that's not the case. I wouldn't be committing so much of my own energy uh, and effort to this issue if I didn't think that there was a real opportunity to get traction with it and ultimately bring about a solution that can be uh, trans transformative. What I wanted to do, and I'm going to try to keep this about 10 or 15 minutes because I do want to get to the panel discussion, then hopefully we can have uh, questions and answers from, uh, from the group here. I wanted to talk about the problem as I see it and then talk about the solution, talk a little bit about the Government by the People Act so you understand the design of it, uh, and then we can bring it to a close. When you talk about the problem these days in terms of the impact that money is having on politics, on elections, on governing, on the democracy. You can look at it um, from two different perspectives. One is sort of the inside perspective. How is it having an impact on the way things are done on Capitol Hill, in Congress, in the halls of Congress, on members' lives? The other is what is the impact on the outside? What is the public's view of what's happening in terms of this increasing influence that money is having on our political system. I'm going to start um, with what I think in some ways is, is the less salient uh, perspective, which is what's happening on the inside, uh, and then I'm going to move to talk about what's happening 
um, on the outside. When you look at what's, what's going on with money's influence in Washington on Capitol Hill, the first thing you notice is that there's not as much diversity of perspective on the Hill because of the effect of money in campaigns. And what I mean by this is many of you have heard the phrase, the money primary. This is the primary you have to get through before you even get into a Democratic or Republican primary. It's the primary where you have to raise money in order to be a viable competitive candidate. The average cost of a congressional campaign, a winning congressional campaign in 2012 was $1.6 million. So if you're gonna be competitive and ultimately have the aspiration to win, you gotta raise huge sums of money. There's a lot of people out there that don't know a lot of people with a lot of money. And they self-select right from the beginning. They might be terrific candidates. They might be active in their community. They may really want to serve the public. But they look at what it takes to run a competitive race, and they basically opt out from the very beginning. So that's, that's an impact on the inside because the diversity, particularly the socioeconomic diversity, that's present on Capitol Hill, in the Senate, in the House, I think is undermined by this inability to get through the money uh, primary. The second thing, and this is, this is something I feel and certainly my colleagues feel, is the tremendous amount of time that fundraising takes away from the things that we ought to be paying attention to. By some estimates, the average member of Congress is spending anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of their time on fundraising, which is a clear departure, obviously, from the expectation uh, of the constituents and the voters that sent them there. What is the casualty of that? Well, one casualty is you don't have the time that you should spend to actually read the material and become knowledgeable about the legislation that supposedly were brokering and passing, and that's a real cost. The second casualty is relationships. If you talk to members of Congress who've been there for two decades or more, they remember a time fondly when they didn't have to spend all their time in Washington fundraising. For starters, they spent more time in Washington because there wasn't this imperative to jump on a jet plane and get back to your district you know, on Thursday afternoon and then fly in on a Monday. But when they were in Washington, they had time for relationships. If you talk to members of Congress, a lot of them could count on one hand the number of times they've had lunch with their colleagues in the last two, three, four years. Because the fact of the matter is if you have enough time to have lunch, you have enough time to make fundraising calls. And your staff will be on you, on you to go do that. So. If you think of relationships as really being the glue that kind of keeps a legislative body together, or the lubricant that allows you to work with each other, reach compromise, pass legislation, that is completely absent now from the institution. And it's, it's happened with predictable results. Even if we were conducting things under regular order, and that means Committees are getting together. They're actually hashing through legislation, and that doesn't really happen so much anymore. Think about the impact that money is having on the way public policy machinery in Washington works uh, in this way. If two members are sitting across a conference room table from one another, and they're trying to hash out some solution, some compromise on a piece of legislation that one or the other of them has, has introduced. They bring certain lenses to that exercise. One lens they bring, which is very fair and appropriate, is what would my constituents think? How will they react to this piece of legislation? And how will they react to my making a compromise here, there, or some other place? The second lens that you bring, and this is an important one, is what does this mean for the country? When we step back and we think about whether this is good national public policy, does it make sense to do this? Should I end up here? Should I make a compromise to reach that objective? <coughs> and traditionally, I think those were the two basic lenses that were brought to the discussion. 
increasingly there's a third lens, and it's become a dominant lens, often. And that is, as you look at a piece of legislation, as you decide whether you're going to make a compromise, you're thinking to yourself, what would my money patrons think about that? How would they react to it? Because you know you have to go raise $1.6 million in order to be competitive in this world. So that's the lens that I think is producing a lot of the gridlock and distortion of how public policy is made. Occasionally, when we do break through the gridlock, it's because the money patrons are getting together and putting pressure equally on both sides to meet a particular agenda that they have. So often when we do break through the gridlock, we're breaking through it in favor of special interests and not in favor of the country. There's a terrific quote that I like to cite. Back in 1982, Bob Dole, at that time the Senate Minority Leader of the Republican Party, said this, when these political action committees give money, they expect something in return other than good government. It is making it much more difficult to legislate. We may reach a point where if everybody is buying something with PAC money, we can't get anything done. That was 30 years ago. That prophecy's been fulfilled because we have plenty of PACs operating up on Capitol Hill and we're not getting anything done. Now let me talk about the outside impact of all of this, uh, which I think is the most pernicious effect of of money's influence in politics and on governing. And that is the deep, deep cynicism and distrust that is really permeating the electorate. I think people look at Washington and they don't see themselves here anymore. They believe that special interests and big money are calling the shots, that it's an insider's game, and that the voice of the average person really is of no consequence whatsoever. You look at what happened in 2014, just now in the November election. The lowest turnout since 1942. And I believe that's a result of a lot of rational voters saying to themselves, why go vote if the person I'm voting for gets to Washington and immediately is captured by special interests? And my voice isn't going to matter anymore. Why don't I just stay home and maintain a little bit of self-dignity? I think that this is the reaction that millions of Americans are having when they look at this, this undue influence that money has in Washington, on our elections, and on the way we govern. The metaphor I like to use is that a lot of good, decent Americans have fled the political town square because they don't think their voice matters. And what happens, unfortunately, is when good people flee the town square, extreme elements rush in. And those are the voices that you hear more of, and it contributes further to the cynicism that the public feels. To me, this is the primary reason why we have to design a, a different system. I mean, I could make the case to you as a member of Congress that I don't want to spend 30 to 70 percent of my time in Washington fundraising, that I want to get back to regular order where we're actually looking at legislation based on the merits and reaching compromise to get things done. I could make the argument based on what it's doing, this system is doing to members of Congress and how it's really in some ways sucking the life out of us. But I prefer to make the argument on behalf of citizens out there in the country who are angry, dispirited, and frustrated because they feel like their government doesn't belong to them uh, anymore. So there's, there's two basic strategies, in my, in my view, for how you begin to address this problem of undue influence of big money in politics. One of them I'll call sort of the containment strategy, and the other is the empowerment strategy. And it's very analogous, uh, Mark, to what you've begun to describe in your paper, which is an excellent um, structure, a kind of framework for how we can look at this issue um, going forward, and you'll hear about that momentarily. So one, one strategy is you try to put some limits on big money out there. And of course, this is the battle that's been fought 
in the Supreme Court over the last few years. It's a battle, unfortunately, that we're, we're losing right now, which has led to the effort um, to push for a constitutional amendment to try to repeal the effects of Citizens United and give Congress the ability to regulate money and politics in a more robust fashion. But it's a tough road to hoe, as you know. This court is not our friend when it comes to putting reasonable limits in place, and a constitutional amendment is a very difficult thing to get done. Now, I support the efforts around that because I think it's a good way to organize the way people are feeling. But just looking at it practically, it is a tough thing to make happen. You have the amendment process to, put, to try to put limits in place. You have disclosure as another mechanism for trying to affect the behavior of these big money players. You have non-coordination rules that people are looking at um, to try to rein in the way they operate. But if you think about it, all of those things I just mentioned are about refereeing the conduct of big money players. It doesn't really do anything to empower the everyday citizen, to bring them in to the solution. And I believe that even as we pursue all those other remedies to try to contain and limit some of the big money actors out there. If we're going to address the cynicism that the average person feels that's driving them out of the political town square and frankly up into the hills out of desperation, if we're going to address that, we have to design a solution that brings them in, that in a sense brings them out of the bleachers and into the ring because they feel like they have power, they have voice, and they have consequence to the way the system operates. And that's the empowerment strategy. And that's what H.R. 20 and the Government by the People Act is all about. Mark refers to this, I think, quite cleverly as political opportunity. You can hear him talk about this. But it's basically the notion of, you know, let's go give some power, some opportunity, some voice and access to those millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions um, of Americans out there who feel like they don't have any. And that's the way we design the Government uh, by the People Act, to try to address that feeling. Let me very briefly tell you what the Act does um, in order to lift people up and give them a sense of power. It's got three components. The first is we wanted to make it easier for everyday citizens, you know, in a world where money is speech, according to this court, how do people of modest means have speech? Well, we thought a refundable tax credit, a small tax credit of $25, would help the average person get into the game. So that's the first piece. Refundable tax credit, we call it the My Voice Tax Credit, because it gives people that sense that their voice, in fact, is consequential. The second piece, which is just as critical, is a six to one match of public funds that will come in behind a small donation if it goes to a candidate that is trying to do the right thing, that is limiting the amount of PAC money that they receive and are dependent upon, that is reducing the amount of high donations that they're um, accepting, and has gone out and built an outreach to a small donor network of everyday citizens out there. If a candidate does that, then every small donation that comes to that candidate will earn a six to one match of public funds from what we call the Freedom from Influence Matching Fund. You've got to have these, you know, these, um, these names for it all, to, all the work. Now why is that so critical? Well, we had a tax credit from 1972 to 1986, as some of you may know, in the federal tax code for contributions to federal candidates. It was actually exactly the same. It wasn't refundable, but the amount was the same. It was a 50% tax credit on donations up to $50 in each of the two years of an election cycle. There was very little uptake of this. And the reason was that it wasn't, it didn't matter, it wasn't worth it to a candidate to go find that small donor. Because if you got to raise 1.6 million, or back in those days, maybe it was a half a million, 
getting a $25 or $50 donation from a small donor is still not enough to make you forswear the K Street fundraiser, the place where you can raise $1,000 from everybody who shows up. What the six to one match does is it completely changes that equation. Now the candidate wants to go find that small donor because a $50 donor is now worth $350 to the candidate. That's real money. That's competitive with the current ways that you raise money. And let me, let me put it in these terms. I would say that most members of Congress, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school, in order to make it worth it to go to some lobbying affair or go to a fundraiser on K Street, one of these kind of traditional places you raise money, has to believe they're going to walk away with $10,000 to make it worth it. Well, there's no way under the current system that you can go have a house party with you know, a bunch of people that live in a neighborhood in your district and raise enough money to compete with that. And so often that competition goes in favor of the deep-pocketed sources. But if you had the Government by the People Act, you had H.R. 20, a system like that, a matching system, here's what would happen. Somebody in your district would say, I want to throw a fundraiser for you, a small donor fundraiser. They'd invite 30 people. Each person would give $50 using their $25 tax credit. That's $1,500. You then get a six to one match of public funds coming in behind that. That's another $9,000. You walk away from that event with $10,500. It is worth it to you as a candidate now to turn in that direction. And here's the other good part of it. If you go to the K Street fundraiser, you may raise $10,000, but I guarantee you that there's not anybody in that room who's going to make phone calls for you, knock on doors, or lick envelopes. And probably most of them can't even vote for you because they don't live in your district. If you go and you do a house party and you invite 30 people and they each come give $50, those are folks who are going to knock on doors, they're going to reach out to their neighbors, who are going to lick envelopes, and they can all vote for you. You're matching up an old-fashioned kind of organizing imperative with fundraising instead of it being split apart the way it is now. That's the promise of reform like what we proposed in H.R. 20. And the last piece is a form of super PAC protection. A candidate in the last 60 days of a general election, and have no fear, constitutional scholars in the room, this has been designed very carefully so it doesn't cross the jurisprudence of the court. That candidate can access some additional public funding through a supercharge on the match, basically. So the point is that once you've created this network of small donors that's there to help you, you can turn to them in the, in the final days of a campaign and they can, in a sense, come to your rescue and help you keep your voice on the field, on the playing field, up through Election Day. And when that happens, you can see candidates across the country that would be able to compete and prevail even in the face of significant spending by outside groups. The last thing I'll mention before I stop, and I've gone on too long, is, <coughs> is this possible? Can we do this? Well, we have 138 original co-sponsors when we introduced the bill two weeks ago on the anniversary of Citizens United. We're adding co-sponsors every day. It's a bipartisan bill because we have one Republican and 137 Democrats, but we can build from there. And what's interesting is the polling data is very strong. And we've had um, Stan Greenberg has done two polls on this, Selinda so Lake has done a third. And what it demonstrates is that the sentiment in support of this kind of empowerment reform cuts across the political spectrum. I've got a few numbers here, I'll give you an example. Democratic women, 72%. Democratic men, 84%. Independent women, 60%. Men, 66%. Republican women, 57%. Men, 53%. Support the kind of reform we're talking about. In battleground districts, H.R. 20's design is supported by 71% of Democrats and 69% of Republicans. And 60% of the electorate 
um, in 2014, according to exit polling and other things, named this kind of reform as a top priority going forward into 2016. To put a fine point on this idea that, that this feeling goes across the spectrum, think about it in these terms. The Occupy movement on the left and the Tea Party movement on the right in their purest forms come from the same place. They come from a feeling out there that there is some shadowy elite of powerful forces in New York and Washington that run a country and everybody else is being left out. If that feeling is, is powerful as this polling data suggests, and anecdotally I can certainly relay based on the conversations I have every single day with people in my district, and I'm one of those few who can drive back home every single day and talk to people uh, in my district, my constituents, then this is not a tree falling in the woods that's not going to be heard. I really believe that this kind of reform could be a seismic event that everybody feels out there in a the country. Now, will it be easy? Absolutely not. Will we get it done tomorrow? No. Will it cure all the ills of the world? No. Would it be an incredibly powerful declaration on the part of the American public that they've had enough and they want to get their government back from special interests, that they want their voices to matter? Absolutely. Would it set the table for even further reform going forward that could make a difference? I think so. So I'm not in this because I'm naive. I'm not in it because I just want to go through an academic exercise. I've stepped into this and I'm going to continue to push for it because I think it could happen. I think that the feeling out there in the country is deep enough and broad enough that if it is organized around solutions like this one and others, that we can actually achieve this kind of change. And so I'll close with this. We're headed into a season of presidential sweepstakes. And all the news from here on out is going to be about who's the next big thing in American politics. And I have interest in that. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to support the Democratic nominee. And I'll do it with enthusiasm. And I expect to be inspired along the way. But I'm starting to think more and more that maybe the next big thing in American politics isn't a person. Maybe the next big thing in American politics is an idea. And maybe it's the idea that people are going to take government back from special interests, that they're going to reassert their voice. And that, to me, is a lot more exciting than personality politics. That, to me, is more inspiring. And election day when you're running a candidate campaign is November 4th. Election day when you're running an idea campaign is the day you bring your reform to the floor of the House or the Senate. We don't know when that election day is going to be, but we want to be ready for it. And we're building a national coalition of diverse constituencies across the country who are stepping up to support this reform because they believe it will make a difference. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you very much, Congressman. That was fantastic. Um, I guess I'll just say a couple words about this uh, paper, and we'll get the discussion going, with which, uh, which Larry will moderate, and then we'll, we'll open it up a little bit. Um, I really like that theme of, uh, of, of being ready, and, and I think I take some inspiration. Uh, some of you probably know Rick Hazen, who writes the Election Law blog. And he wrote a piece a, year, a couple of years ago where he said, you know, you, don't, you shouldn't expect that you're going to have a breakthrough on this idea tomorrow. And, Actually, that's, that's a moment. What you should understand is this is your moment to really begin to rethink some of these ideas. And you know, I've been involved in this field for about 18 years. I first got involved in the Hill when, thing, when I worked on the Hill. And things were totally, the whole framing of the issues was very different at that time. <coughs> and I think we've learned a lot since then. And I think it's an opportunity to step back and actually ask some questions about, like, what are we actually, what's our vision of politics? What are we actually thinking about? What are we trying to do here? Um, and part of what I talk about in this, uh, in this paper is that, you know, we're kind of governed by metaphors a lot when we, we talk about politics. So very often, you know, a lot of effort goes into the, into the idea that it's all just about preventing corruption 
That's the only thing the Supreme Court has given us. And there we see, well, the Supreme Court says, well, it has to be a quid pro quo corruption. I think we all know there are a lot of other kinds of corruption. But we have a vision of politics where there are politicians who they have a clear idea of what the public interest is. But you know that donor shows up and says, yeah, remember that $10,000 we put together at that K Street fundraiser. You've got to be with me on this. That's our, that's our kind of vision of how corruption works. And it certainly works sometimes like that. But that's not everything. Because very often we have people elected who simply have a different idea of what the public interest is. And we have very limited pathways of kind of what's even on the table uh, for, for what those ideas are. That's part of, I think, why we've had trouble kind of coming up with a full range of ways to respond to uh, the economic crisis or, or, or inequality. There's just the menu is, is, is too narrow uh, because there's only certain things that are kind of get past the, uh, the, the, the money primary. So very often when we think we're talking about corruption, we really want to be talking about something more like political equality, more like, you know, breaking down some of the inequality in the economic, the way, the, the way economic inequality is reinforced in the political system and in turn reinforces economic inequality uh, overall in a way that kind of makes, you know, leads to stagnation. We want to think in terms of equality, but equality is a tough value. I mean, the Supreme Court says, you know, it's alien to, to our, our concept of the First Amendment. They said that not in Citizens United, but in Buckley Vallejo in the 1970s. Uh, it's not a framework that they've seen as justified for, uh, for, for how you think about, about regulating money in politics, and kind of with some reason. There's a lot of inequality in life. You can't you know, work all of it out. I mean, I worked, I worked on the Hill for a member of Congress who'd been an NBA star. So you, know, you kind of came in with some inequality uh, right there. And there's a lot of inequality. That, that, there's inequality of organization. You know, uh, there's a, there, our, this vision of a, of a kind of paradise where everybody's exactly equal is a hard one to really realize. Um, so I felt like we needed to, you know, kind of get past those two choices and think about it in a somewhat different way. And thinking about it in terms of political opportunity also gets gets you out of the trap of, uh, of of really talking about where you're restricting the First Amendment. Because we really, I, I don't want to be in a fight with the First Amendment. I think freedom of expression is incredibly valuable. I think that the, you know, the breakthrough in American history where, you know, Justice Holmes and Brandeis recognize that as a real value. I think that's a really important part of our tradition. Uh, and I think, I think elections, are, elections are confined. Elections have, have rules, and some of those rules do restrict free expression, like you know, no, no electioneering uh, within 75 feet of a polling place and things like that. But you know, for the most part, we want to try to, uh, uh, to, to respect those values. And we can do that best by creating more opportunity rather than, rather than trying to restrict all the, all, all the other avenues that money enters politics. And you know what? There are going to be other avenues through which money and economic inequality enters politics. I mean, people have started writing about, I mean, you know, he, we're here at a think tank. Uh, people have started writing about the ways in which, you know, money going through think tanks kind of corrupts and changes the process. Uh, there's a huge amount, you know, all the, you know, all, all the kinds of different kinds of lobbying that goes on and communications that, simp that aren't actually about the election but influence politics and actually influence the election. I mean, last year you had a lot of uh, Koch brother ad, Koch brother funded ads that were just attacks on Obamacare, which is an issue. But obviously, if you do enough of that, you have some effect on the election as well. Um, so I think by thinking about uh, about political opportunity, which includes all the kinds of ideas that um, that Congressman Sarbanes has been talking about here, things that we see working in New York City, uh, we see them working in a place like Minnesota, which has a the refundable tax credit. It includes all of those ideas that kind of make it easier to get into the election and compete and you know listen to the voices of, of small donors rather than the, the big <laughs> fundraisers. But the idea includes a lot more than that as well. I think it should include you know, thinking about how do we make it easier for people to actually organize to be heard uh, so, that, so that you're not just looking in terms of individuals. It has to include thinking about technology, what's happening in the world that makes it possible to do some of the things uh, that the government by the people act proposes you know things like you know act blue that has helped a lot of you know small donors find candidates that might really reflect their views and there are republican counterparts to that uh, act blue i think got a head start there's a great project called nation builder which kind of reduces all those startup costs there's a uh, there, you know there's a concept in business now of the lean startup all the things that you shouldn't have, that you used to have to do 
in order to start a company. And all those things you used to have to do to start a political campaign too. You had to figure out how your email was going to work. You, had to, you basically had to do all the things that would go into starting you know, a medium-sized company. Things like Nation Builder make it possible to just jump over uh, a lot of that. Everything is kind of available to you. If we combine those ideas with legislative ideas and are kind of realistic about what we're trying to do, I think we could get to a very different place than what we were talking about in the, in the era of the more traditional kind of containment uh, approach to money in politics. So. All right. I heard a lot of hints there <laughs> in terms of what, what I might want to ask I about. Stole all of it. Um, <laughs> so before before we, we jump in, I I, I do want to thank uh, New America uh, for hosting this event. Um, I'm I'm a big fan of of New America and the work they do and and the people who are associated with it. Um, and I also want to um, thank them for partnering with us on this um, excellent paper uh, that that Mark has put out. And um, while that was a pretty good uh, summary. I, it, it really is worth reading it through. It's, it's short, um, but it very, very rich in talking about, I think, um, some of the challenges in, in frames that exist right now when we talk about money and politics and, and um, when we fight court battles over money and politics um, and, uh, and, and, and presents, I think, a very interesting um, new framework uh, for that work. Um, this is obviously, uh, for, for those of us who are focused on um, democracy issues like the LeBrennan Center and, and um, New America, this, this is a, a critical and uh, challenging time. Uh, as the Congressman mentioned, it's recently the fifth uh, anniversary of Citizens United. Um, we've got uh, um, all kind, around the country all kinds of new restrictions on the franchise. Uh, and um, there, there are so many data points to point uh, that point to um, what the congressman um, talked about earlier, a, a kind of a disillusionment with the political process and, and, a, and a belief um, among a significant part of Americans anyway that their voice doesn't matter anymore. Um, so quickly I just wanted to mention that for the Brennan Center this paper is part of our um, uh, new ideas for a new democracy uh, series. Um, we take very seriously the idea at this critical moment. Um, we do need to be thinking about um, innovation, uh, policy innovation in this space. <coughs> and I, I do think, uh, Mark, that this is a great inaugural paper for that uh, series. Um, uh, we also, I, I just want to um, recognize that both um, Chairman R Rabel and, and the Congressman um, are really um, have been two of the foremost uh, national leaders on, on coming up with new ideas and um, thinking about exactly what it is that we want out of our democracy. So I, th I think that might be a good place to start. We've already heard a little bit from um, both Mark and Congressman Sarbanes uh, about um, what their idea of what we want out of our democracy. Um, but maybe, maybe we can be a little bit more specific about that. What, it, what is it that, um, what, what, what kind of democracy would you like to see? What kind of democracy do you think uh, reformers should be aiming for? And, and maybe we can follow up that with um, the role of money in politics and all that. Maybe you could start with that, Anne. Let me um, start a little bit with what it is that makes me view uh, political reform and political um, campaign issues the way I do. And it is that I've worked um, at every level of government, federal, state, and local, mostly in local. And so I have a really strong feeling about just what the congressman was talking about, about what I call civic engagement. It's very similar to what um, Mark is also talking about. And it's that how important it is to have transparency and to have people involved in government. For one thing, it legitimizes it. And for another reason, it's that people and, and, and trust in government comes with their involvement, I believe. And it's funny, there's, <coughs> there, and I know this is not answering your question specifically, but I, you know, I know that um, the issue of trust in government is sort of interesting because when the FEC was established, there, there's a um, poll that's done every year, pretty much, 
which asks people, you know, do you trust your government to do the right thing? And right after Watergate, uh, the respondents saying yes were about 34, I think, or 36 percent. Um, today, it's 16 percent. And I think that's horrible. I think that says something really, really bad about us. And so we need to do exactly as they both suggested. I think it's important to get more people involved, more people voting, more people um, participating, more people in the dialogue. And you know, we can talk about the reasons, but I think one of the problems, of course, is that there are you know, not sufficient, and, and the congressman talked about economic disparities, but there's, um, even for the majority of women in this country, there's not significant representation of women. There's not significant representation of other, other minorities. And I just think we've got to do things that bring more people into the, into the dialogue. And that's really what political reform should be doing. That actually answers my question. <laughs> uh, so I, I hear a lot about the idea of more participation. Um, uh, Mark uh, and Congressman Sarbanes, um, I, you, can, you can correct my summary of, of your paper, but p part of what I hear you saying uh, is that a really big problem in, in, our, our, in democracy in America today is that both of you are saying is bar bar barriers to entry. Um, that a lot of people are just uh, are left out of running for office um, and are left out of being heard um, from the people who are in office. Um, and that um, limits on, on spending of the wealthy um, can only get you so far. And in fact, you know, may not even really be all that possible. That there are all kinds of ways that money uh, influences the political system. So uh, political opportunity certainly sounds like a, a, a a great reframing, lifting people up so that their voices can be heard. The question I have um, about that, though, is: um, uh, is it too is it too late for that? Um, uh, I'm just going to read out some numbers uh, that that um, Brennison or others have put out. Politico, uh, Politico reported uh, after the election that um, in 2014, the top 100 donors. Um, spent as much, and the truth is probably more because there's all this, all this dark money out there, uh, as um, the 4.75 million small donors uh, in the election. Um, since 2010, uh, less than 200 people uh, have given 60% of all money uh, to super PACs. My boss, Michael Waldman, uh, often talks about uh, an arms race between the small donors and, and the big donors. And um, it, it's starting to feel like it's th that that arms race is already over. Um, Mark points to New York City, um, where where a lot of the, the fundraising is done along the lines that um, Congressman Sarbanes talked about. There are house parties, and and candidates are really focused on small donors. But I, I have to tell you, I've been working in the effort in New York State, and a lot of legislators in New York State say. Um, you know what? It doesn't matter. Uh, somebody, a candidate, will set up a candidate-specific super PAC. They may, they may raise small donations um, from people that are giving one hundred, two hundred dollar checks. At the end of the day, it's going to be the guy that gives the million dollar check to the super PAC that's going to matter. Is there, is there still a chance for this kind of political opportunity? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's something that I, you know, we think about a lot. It's, it, I think there was a moment when we started to see the, the really large number of small donors, particularly around the two Obama campaigns, but around a number of other campaigns as well, where it, where it seemed like you could kind of ride a really positive wave uh, towards these, these reforms. The last, you know, three, four years have really created some, some big challenges as these, other, as these other pools of money have a uh, have emerged, and uh, you know, I like to think of them almost as it's not just like money wanting to get into the system. It's it's like you know, there are people who kind of are brokers of access to money, who have a huge amount of power in the system because they are they are the they are the key points that help you uh, get out of the regulated system and 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 into this into this unregulated world. You know, at the end of the day, there's a concept that I think most political scientists are familiar with, but that is a little bit counterintuitive, which is just that, you know, there, 
it's not that money doesn't matter. Sometimes people say, oh, money doesn't matter, and there's, you know, the New York Times has done, like David Brooks did this, and a couple of other people have done it. It's not that money doesn't matter, but there's a threshold, and then there are diminishing returns. You know, so the key to a bar the barrier to entry into a competitive political campaign is just getting to the point where you can be heard, which is different in every kind of race, but it's something. Um, and beyond a certain amount above that, the money you're spending doesn't really matter that much. So for example, I'll use, you, you know, use the example of New York. In 2009, when Mayor Bloomberg ran against, um, against uh, Bill Thompson, the, the comptroller Thompson had with the city's public financing system, he had, uh, I think, about $18 million. Bloomberg spent somewhere between 85 and $100 million. Well, it was turned out to be a pretty close race. So Thompson clearly hit that threshold where he was able to be competitive with the help of the small donor system. And some amount of money that Bloomberg spent, somewhere between 20 and 100 million, was, you know, he wasn't getting anything more uh, beyond that point. So it's not that we have, you know, it's easy to have the sticker shock at the big giant dollars. Uh, and the big giant dollars intimidate candidates from getting into races. They, they give these brokers power. They have a, a lot of negative effect. But the number alone is not the most significant thing once you get beyond a, you know, a certain level. I agree with that 100%. I mean, I think it's easy to get trapped into this frame of can we equal the amounts that are coming in, whether it's from a self-funded uh, candidate or it's the super PACs that are on attack. Um, the, the better question, and, and Mark's alluded to this, is sufficiency. Uh, can you raise sufficient funds that you can continue to keep your voice in the mix up through Election Day? And I think that is quite possible. I think that if you particularly establish, because you're incentivized by a small donor matching system to do it, establish a broad network of small donors, you then have them available to come to your aid in those final days of the campaign. And again, they don't have to contribute enough to match the spending that may come at you from an outside group or a super PAC. They just have to get you enough that your voice can stay in the mix. I can guarantee you, and I think there's examples of this, that a candidate who has built a strong relationship with their constituents, who has emphasized the power of small donors and, and the voices of everyday uh, citizens, they can arrive at election day, and if they've had enough resources to be able to keep their voice in front of those voters, even if they're being outspent two to one or three to one or four to one, they can often prevail and win. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when you look back over the last couple election cycles, you see examples of this um, happening. The other point I want to make is uh, the focus often it, when deciding whether money matters or doesn't matter is on the outcome on election day. But we have to continue to look at money's impact past Election Day. When David Brooks was writing that, you know, it all comes out in the wash, he was citing races where, you know, the Republican and the Democrat essentially were able to raise about the same amount of money, $3 million, $4 million. So he concludes, well, that wasn't really the determinator in the election because they both raised about the same amount. What he's not looking at is the fact that whoever wins arrives in Washington, having had $4 million contributed to their campaign, much of which may come from special interests. So you have to continue to look past election day to, to, to determine the impact um, that, that, that's being had by money uh, in politics. And, and frankly, that's a problem, what I'm describing, existed before Citizens United, and even if we fixed Citizens United, would continue to exist. There's the dependency on direct campaign contributions, which is the most distorting, I believe, of how public policy gets made um, in Washington. And that's the kind of thing that you address when you create a different place for members of Congress to go to raise money for their campaigns. And you, you're advancing the Madisonian ideal that government will be dependent upon the people 
alone. We've gotten very far away from that. If we don't get back to it, we can't expect to address the cynicism in the public. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, one question that I have is, you know, but part of this is also the perception of the office holder themselves, I suppose, right, Congressman? And, you know, when you, ha when you have a, the, when you have the Koch brothers saying that they're going to spend a billion dollars in an election, um, uh, won't that have an impact, r regardless of where they're raising their money from, won't, won't the threat of big money out there have an impact on, um, uh, on decision making and, and the way that um, office holders relate to various issues? I think it does. There's no, I mean, you can't pretend that it doesn't affect people's outlook, but I don't think it has to be determinative. And, and frankly, I think that the, this latest announcement that they're going to spend $899 or $89 million, whatever it is, through this shadowy consortium of groups, although they seem perfectly prepared to just talk about it openly, because um, I guess they realize a lot of people have fled into the hills and aren't, aren't, aren't paying attention. But I think it was greeted less with fear, for example, by members of the, of the Democratic Caucus in this case, because I was at the retreat when that number, in Philadelphia when that number was released, uh, than it was greeted with a kind of combination of anger and determination that we will not let this stand. Now, if you translate that feeling where you connect to the feeling that I think people out in the country have as well about that and organize that energy in a positive way into the kinds of reforms that we're talking about, I just don't believe at the end of the day that the Koch brothers are more powerful than 300 million Americans who decide that they want to get their, cover their government back. And I'll say one other thing. In some ways, the Koch brothers are the most supremely uninteresting people in the world because <laughs> they're just two billionaires who are trying to buy influence and, and access and everything else the way it's been done for hundreds of years. The more interesting story would be some guy in a neighborhood who owns a diner or has a bunch of friends in a book club who says, you know what, I'm going to become a power player by getting 30 of my friends together, having them each contribute $50, earn matching funds, and be able to say to a candidate that wants to do the right thing, here's resources that allow you to run a competitive campaign. And by the way, to get back to your first question, what am I looking for in a democracy? A representative democracy. And I emphasize that because I think what's happened is, and the reason people are giving up, is they don't feel like they're being represented anymore. We're celebrating this year the March from Selma to Montgomery, 50 years since that amazing protest for the right to vote. And I'm encouraging people, as they think back on that, to realize that the journey of empowerment doesn't end at the ballot box. It continues as that ballot box makes its way to Washington. And if the ballot box gets hijacked or commandeered by special interests and a bunch of lobbyists before it gets to Washington, then the franchise has been compromised because no longer are you being represented that person is actually going to have to go do the bidding of special interests and big money. So if we want to preserve our representative democracy, we have to not just preserve the right to vote. We have to preserve the right to have your vote mean something. And that's what the kind of reform of money and politics that we're talking about is designed to do. OK, so we have a lot of agreement, uh, Ms. Powell. I want to I wanna see if I can foster some uh, disagreement. <laughs> So again, Mark, I'm going to take some liberties with um, uh, maybe uh, in summarizing what you've said. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. But w it, two points that you made um, uh, that um, struck me uh, were that, number one, you, you talked about kind of uh, the limits to limits, um, that um, you can try to limit political spending and you made this point you alluded to this a bit in your in, in summarizing your paper but you know that we, we, we become so um, ideological uh, ideologically partisan um, that you can run an ad uh, an anti-obama
Altair ad eight months before an election in a congressman's district, and everybody will know what that's about. Um, and that's really political spending, but I don't think under a, any proposal I've seen, something like that, um, there is a proposal to restrict that kind of speech. Um, and um, you all, you're even in some ways harsher uh, in your, in your, or more scathing in your uh, criticism of what disclosure uh, might bring. And I, I think the way you put it is that, that mostly what um, disclosure uh, of um, political spending will tell us is that uh, almost everybody in office is backed by a, a lot of rich people. Um, and that it's there that that um, that it's too much to expect from the public uh, with all that money that is out there that they'll really be able to make informed uh, choices based on that kind of information. So um, uh, I'm, I'm I'm wondering, uh, given that summary, if either um, uh, Chair Ravel or Congressman Sarbanes, if you have any disagreement with either of those points. I do. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I might want to clarify them. Well, with regard to limits, I, and I, I agree with Mark in the sense that um, limits have limits. And uh, there have been times I've been ambivalent about it and thought, yes, maybe they're right back in the day when some people said, let's have 24-hour disclosure and no limits, and that maybe that's a solution to all the super PACs and the other independent money that's coming in, and that might be appropriate to be able to balance it out. At least we know who's giving money. But I now, um, thinking about it through the lens of participation and engagement, I think that all of the things that the congressman has talked about and even Mark has talked about, about ways to get more people involved, that they would best work in tandem with limits. Because I think that limits at least will, in some ways, encourage people to, or candidates, to also use small donors as a way to, um, to contribute to their campaigns. So, I think just as a matter of just, um, you know, one way to encourage even more money coming through small donors. Uh, with regard to disclosure, though, <clears throat> that is where I have the most serious disagreement. And I, I, I am not under any illusion that disclosure is going to solve campaign finance problems and the issues that we've been talking about, about um, people's disaffection. but. There is a lot of evidence that when people know more about um, politics and political campaigns, that they do feel more trust in the system. There's been studies done that say this, and the reverse is true. If they don't have that information, that's when they feel distrust and less empowered and less involved. I think there's a direct correlation between disclosure and information and you know, the feeling of trust and empowerment. And in, and also, I think, disclosure, um, well, a lot of people aren't going to be um, understanding and just thinking that it's just, oh, it's more rich people behind things. I, there are a, a lot of examples in politics where disclosure has made a huge difference. And I can think of one. <clears throat> there's a bunch of them from California, but there's one that's really kind of an amazing um, example. <clears throat> and it was in the Harry Reid case against Sharon Engel. And there were, um, this is not disclosure, this discla I guess it was disclosure too. And there, there were ads being aired throughout Nevada that were in Spanish. And they were called no votes. And it was to urge people Hispanics not to vote in the campaign, to sit it out, don't vote for Harry Reid, because he and Obama are trying to um, uh, send people back to Mexico. And so there was kind of a big, you know, sort of backlash, and there were a lot of people who, and they claimed that they were from some Hispanic group. Um, but because of disclosure, 
it was discovered that who was actually behind this were people, there was like one Hispanic who had been in a Republican administration whose only um, interest in immigration was to actually send people back, um, and nobody else, everybody. And, and as a result, I mean, it made a really big difference in terms of the, of the Hispanic vote in Nevada. And I, there's a ton of examples like that. People use them as voting cues. I think it's really important for busy people who don't know um, about sort of backgrounds of people to have that information. And that's one of the reasons dark money is so problematic because, and I, I saw this in California, people uh, talk about getting concerned and really interested about these issues when $11 million of dark money was dropped two, two weeks before an election. People were outraged about it because nobody knew who was behind it. It came from out of state. Nobody had ever heard of this group before. So I, I think disclosure, <laughs> I'm getting worked up, right. makes a difference. <laughs> well, I, I agree that I, I think the point is that um, disclosure can't solve completely the problem that we've been talking about. It's an important component. No question, and so we, we <coughs> need to keep pushing. And, and frankly, that's one area where the court seems r ready to to give us uh, you know give us an oppor an opportunity. So for that reason alone, you might pursue it vigorously because I think it is it, it can make a difference. Um, but at the same time, I do think you need this empowerment strategy because. Um, there's another level at which it can be demoralizing if, again, you're, you're just, you feel like an observer in your own democracy, kind of on the sidelines watching it play out. And it's, it's sort of like watching, you know, lifestyles of the rich and famous or something. You sort of, you see all these big money players out there. And now, <coughs> yes, there's a better set of rules for how they're going to conduct themselves, non-coordination and and, and disclosure and potentially even some limits if you can if you can make that happen but again the average person is still sitting out there in the bleachers and saying this is great but where do I fit in and so I think that has to be um, an integral part of any package of reform measures that we put forward because you can, you can watch those big money players sitting in your house on television. What's going to get you to come back into the political town square is believing that your voice is actually consequential. And that's the piece that's sorely missing um, right now. But you have to resource it. You have to make it robust so it's not, it's not a bait and switch on that voter out there. And when we were designing the Government by the People Act, there were two audiences that we, we needed to address. Uh, one were members of Congress. We had to convince them that if they participated in this, they could actually still be competitive. And we, we can show that. We built a model. We run the numbers from their 2014 fundraising through the model. And we can show many of them do better. A majority of them do better if they participate in a system like this. But the other audience were those disaffected members of the public out there. And they needed to look at this. And when they peeled it back, come away <coughs> saying, these aren't talking points. This isn't gimmickry. This is real reform, and I'm at the center of it. That's the path back from this deep cynicism that's out there. One of the paths back, but I think an important one. If I can defend myself slightly. <coughs> uh, I mean, I think, I think there are a couple points here. One is I think, you know, we, uh, <coughs> I, I, limits are important. But what you want, it, the value of creating a system like this is it puts less pressure on the limits. So there's less payoff to evading the limits. There's less, even though you might have some outside spending, it's not usually in a place like New York, for New York City, for example, it's not candidates themselves or their operatives setting these things up. It's, it's spontaneous and it's people trying to, uh, trying to get into the system rather than rather than candidates evading limits. So I think you need, you know, we want to make limits work, and that's important. On disclosure, I mean, 
obviously uh, the chairwoman's points are, are great examples of wh why disclosure is really important for these big uh, this big outside spending. Uh, I'm not sure it's that valuable for all you know the run of the mill uh, contributors, and it's not some th this model where I you know I as a voter will look at all the people who contributed to a candidate and kind of figure out why, whether I should vote for them or not. That's a kind of idealized model that doesn't really work. I'm a li uh, just to be a little provocative. I think we ought to think about whether, as part of small donor empowerment, we think we rethink what's the level of, at which a donation should be disclosed. It's currently two hundred dollars at the federal level. It's lower in some states. You know, it's a lot. It's also a lot easier to see that now. You know, you might do a Google search on somebody, and the first thing that comes up actually is their FEC record. I don't know that that's. I think we ought to really consider whether that does or doesn't discourage people. There's some academic research on that. Uh, one area that I'm really interested in, and I think we're going to do some work on this later, uh, that gets very little attention is the amount of workplace pressure that now is placed on people, uh, sometimes to make contributions, sometimes to you know spend it. I mean, the FEC has had a couple interesting cases on this. Uh, one where uh, employees of a union, not members of a union, employees were uh, were directed to take their weekend and campaign for a candidate. Uh, the other cases where workers at a coal mine uh, were ordered to take the day off and attend a rally for uh, for Mitt Romney. I mean, there's a lot of, and I'm be just beginning to, to dig into some of the research on this. There's a lot more of this out there than we know about. And if your worker, if your boss is telling you what you should do politically, you know, you you don't, you know, you kind of have a right for them not to see, you, you, you have a little bit of a right to privacy below a certain level. And there's so much more of that than we know about. And I, I, hope, I hope people here will come back when we have an event on that uh, in a couple months. So I, I definitely want to leave time for audience questions. I, I want to, a couple of points I just wanted to wrap up on and, and maybe be a little bit provocative myself. Um, one is we're talking about you know setting up a, a, a system that allows for political opportunity and, and Congressman Sarbanes outlined his, uh, the, the elements in his bill, and Mark, you've talked about New York City. Um, you know, one of the things about the New York City system is you have a campaign finance board that is committed to that system, that really enforces that system, that, that not only works for enforcement, but that is constantly looking for ways to ensure that small donors are central in that system and that, um, that the system has changed so much over the last 30 years, making recommendations for, the, for that system be, to be changed, going to the city council and getting those recommendations adopted, uh, it's hard to imagine um, that at the federal level. I didn't see a question is, mark is at that the end right? of that. Is that, is that, is that a provocative <laughs> question <laughs> or thought? Um, it, is, it is hard to imagine it. but. Um, along with the long view that we've been talking about today, um, I think that with enough um, public outrage, public desire that there be enforcement, that, that people you know, take these issues seriously, I think it can change. I'm, I have not given up. If so, if I had, <laughs> I'd be in California right now enjoying 80 degrees sunshine. <laughs> well, certainly, in, you know, I, in, in doing some research about the different states and municipal systems, I've kind of come to the conclusion that there is one secret sauce that you know you can make any kind of system work or not work. But having an agency that's really devoted to it, that's really trusted, that not only enforces it, but you know holds those hearings to say what worked and what didn't, is willing to make recommendations, shares a commitment to the bait. Even you know they're. There are people on those commissions don't agree with each other. They're sometimes they're totally nonpartisan, but you know they have their their views. But they share a, they share the values of the commission. Uh, that's the secret sauce. Yeah, and let me let me add about that. I mean, it's not as if and Commissioner Weintraub is here. Um, it's not as if we don't really take this seriously. And in fact, we do want the public to. Um, come in and take a look at what we're doing at the FEC and just for everybody in the uh, audience next week um, on February 11th, we are having the first ever in the history of the FEC um, an open hearing for the public to come and testify about any issues that you have. 
with the campaign finance system. So we would welcome you and anybody else to come and talk to us because the commission has too long been insulated from hearing what the American public feels about this. So I, we, we should uh, allow some questions. And if, while, while we're getting the question, I wonder if you could comment on some, Mark talks about technology helping for participation. Right. I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, I, I'd really like to because this is a ma something that I think is really going to make a difference. And I've spent a lot of time um, thinking about talking to people and talking to people in um, Silicon Valley where I'm from about tech using technology to get greater um, civic engagement, greater participation um, along the lines of what Mark already talked about. And there, t the time has shifted in Silicon Valley and people are now thinking very seriously about government and about how what they can do um, with technology can make a positive difference in our society. There, it's no longer just about a nice new um, iPhone every year. And so they, um, there's lots of groups. I mean, you mentioned a couple. Um, there's some others who are trying to engage people in new ways um, that may not even include money or contributions. I mean, there could be contributions at the end. For example, there's a group and it's being funded by um, Sean Parker at Napster or by, for a lot of money. It's called Brigade, and one of the things that they're doing is working on a BuzzFeed-like um, platform that will either have questionnaires for people um, online, all of this online, and you know, some of us will take all these questionnaires and say, yes, you should live in New York City as opposed to San Francisco or whatever. Instead, what they're hoping to do is get a series of questions about people's views and, and then at the end of it they will say, based on your responses here, we think that you would be supporting this candidate or that candidate. Um, would you like to sign up and show your support and say that you are going to be supporting that person? You don't have to give money. You can give money if you want. And they're hoping millions of people, they're looking for a, a really big platform, will sign up. And that way they can avoid the money issue, indicate to the candidates, here's your support. These people have actually put their names on the line. And they're going to do this not only at BuzzFeed questions, they're going to do it with games and other things that will appeal to a vast audience. And there's lots of other groups that are thinking in the same ways, and I think it's going to have I'm very optimistic that it's going to have a big uh, um, impact on trying to get the kinds of um, involvement, not just of the small donors we have now, but of all the people that they can, as long as we can get more access to the internet from all communities as well, because that's a, you know, that's a fiscal issue too. But anyway, don't want to go on too long. But. I, I, I want to have uh, Lee Drutman, who's my colleague here and who has a book coming out about lobbying, will moderate the Q&A, or uh, will moderate the audience participation. So. Um, let's, uh, let's, uh, anyway, so raise your hands if you want. <laughs> um, uh, Hi. Hi, my name is Rowie. I'm the executive director of uh, an anti-corruption organization called Not In My Country, and we create web and mobile applications that empower people to fight corruption. So the things that I'm hearing from the panel here are music to my ears of using technology in new and interesting ways. My question is, um, and by the way, I think your proposal, uh, Congressman, is fantastic, and I, and I am very interested in getting behind it. Um, but I also wonder if we should be doing more to enforce laws that already exist on the on the books, the one that comes to mind that no one ever seems to bring up is the False Claims Act, which was passed uh, at the end of the Civil War, which was a, a period that uh, some people might know uh, involved a lot of corruption, war profiteering, government contracts, so on. Um, what's interesting about this law is that it empowers whistleblowers by saying that anyone that has information related to waste, fraud, abuse, or corruption 
in government contracts, if you bring the information to the DOJ uh, and it pro they, you can prove that, that, that this is in fact the case, the contractor can be charged uh, three times as much and the whistleblower gets 15 to 25 percent as a reward. But you don't, the, the American public doesn't seem to know that that's there. And we're always talking about the investment side of corruption, but not about the execution side on the other end when all this money gets funneled into uh, uh, the pockets of the elites, shall we say. Um, and I'm wondering if there might be more that we can do to promote um, the False Claims Act, for example. Well, I, I confess I've not thought about the application of the False Claims Act to this area of money and politics, and I'd have to think through exactly what the nexus would be in terms of using the False Claims Act. I mean, obviously it's premised first and foremost and fundamentally on the idea that a false claim is being made. Um, so you have a definitional challenge there in terms of looking at the kind of activity that goes on in the making of donations and then the spending of money in campaign. So I'm intrigued, but I, I can't tell you that I have an immediate reaction to it. And, and I have a, a quote plan. The idea of the, the, all these rulings the Supreme Court have made, not all of them, but at least 100 are null and void. Corporations, there's no way you could read the Constitution to say they have rights. They are committing fraud on the court when they quote a precedent that says that. And that has to be, they, so we have to get the, and if you pass a new law, they, they can vacate it. They, 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 could, they can do all kinds of things with it. Congress makes the laws. They cannot vacate the law or, or, or do away with it. The other point, one of the main point, it has to be part of a bigger plan. If we don't have a justice department that's going to enforce the rule of law, if we don't have a police department and people uh, that are going to get rid of these stupid illegal wars, we're, we're not going to have, pro we'll have problems if we don't get rid of the wealth divide. Anyway, thank you very much. I think we'll just let the, the, those comments stand. All right. Um, let's go all the way back. Hi, my name is Richard Skinner. And uh, one of the criticisms that's often made of programs to encourage small donors is that they're going to empower more extreme candidates because small donors are more likely to support extreme candidates as opposed to large donors who might be more access oriented. I think there's actually quite a bit of evidence against that proposition, but I'm wondering if anybody on the panel has concerns uh, that something like a tax credit scheme or a matching scheme uh, would end up uh, empowering people uh, farther to the left or farther to the right. Well, I'd love to address that because I've heard that critique, I think the problem with that is that people that worry about it are looking at the small donor universe as it exists now and not thinking about the small donor universe that we can create with the kinds of incentives that, that we've put into our legislation. What I mean by that is um, you do have this universe of small donors that responds to um, you know, a kind of light your hair on fire appeal. Um, and it, it tends to be a, a polarized group on one side or the other. So people look at that and they say, my God, if we're gonna, if we're gonna go into a world where we're, we're trying to create, you know, millions of more small donors, aren't we just gonna end up with that kind of a, of a group? I think that there's, there's such a thing as, uh, say, the rational small donor who right now isn't going to give $25 because they've figured out that it doesn't matter. They, so in other words, when you make the appeal, unless they're motivated by some, you know, some kind of passionate response, um, if they look at it analytically, and I think that's where most Americans would be as potential small donors, they're going to say, I'm not going to give $25 or $50 because there's somebody out there who can give 1000 or 5000 who's going to get the attention of the candidate. I think what you do with a matching system is you encourage these rational small donors to get into the game because now they're saying, well, you know what, $50 actually will get 
some attention. And if I organize 25 or 30 of my friends to do the same thing, I'm going to have the candidate standing in my living room instead of standing on K Street. So I think we need to be careful not to predict what a small donor universe would look like, which I think would be a, a kind of universe of rational small donors who now want to step into the game and become power players by just looking at what the small donor experience has been up to this point in time. If I can just add to that, I, I think we've seen in New York City that it's also the, can the candidate behavior itself changes. So you have candidates affirmatively going out and, and trying to organize small donors, whereas, as the congressman was saying before, it would have never occurred to the candidate to say, hey, I'll, I'll ask my, my friend, Joe, to get 10 of his friends, um, and they only have to contribute $20 each, and suddenly I've made a lot of money. And I, we, we have definitely seen that happen in New York. Um, and I don't, I don't think in New York City you've particularly gotten um, ideologically extreme candidates running under the system and, and winning under the system. I think that, can I just say, I think that's, that, that's basically right. I also think there's a lot of things that, that you've built into your bill, Congressman, that think about this. So like having the, uh, the matches and credit available only for in-state contributions means that you don't have, a lot of the times when people study this, they look at you know, people like Michelle Bachman who have big national mailing lists of small donors. Um, but if you're, if you're really giving the preference to in-state or in-district, uh, donors, you have a very different uh, calculus there. But it, you know, some of it has, isn't, there are things we don't know. We don't know what a, a, a tax credit system would really, you know, hopefully it would bring in a lot of different people who are not currently donors uh, and who are probably not as, as engaged. But we, you know, a lot of this requires some experimentation. I would love to see a state or city really try just a pure voucher. Just, you know, here's your 25 bucks to all, the only thing you can do with it is make a political contribution to a, to a candidate, to a party, maybe to an organization, and begin to see what would happen. There's a lot that we, that we should be eager to know more about. Thanks. Hi. Uh, Adam Liaz with Demos. Uh, Mark, I'm hoping you could say a little bit more about the constitutional implications for this. So um, what are we moving beyond corruption as a legal framework towards political opportunity? What kinds of policies would be upheld that are that are currently struck down? Well, I think if you, I think w you know, we don't know how far the courts go wants to go beyond where it is. I mean, pretty much everything we're talking about here would be whatever framework you use would be upheld. Uh, no matter you, you, you don't really need a whole new framework. Uh, in order to be pretty confident that something like the Government by the People Act would be, uh, would, would be upheld. But it would give you more room to do that. But one of the things I'm trying to do here, I mean, in a way, kind of my thinking about this began with a conference at the Brennan Center, which was a lot of people, were, 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 uh, I, I think you were there too, uh, you know, was a lot of you know, real legal superstars thinking about how do we think about the legal framework for this. And I kind of came away thinking, well, I want to make sure we're thinking about the legal framework, not as a thing in itself, like what are we going to tell the Supreme Court, but as the, the legal framework and the, and the actual way we talk about this in the real world need to be, you know, need to be kind of the same thing. Uh, and need to reflect uh, one another and, and happen at the same time. So that's, that's a, a big part of, of my goal here is to kind of bring those two things in, in alignment. Paul Blumenthal, Huffington Post. Um, I guess my question is to the congressman and to uh, Mark mostly about, uh, you know, an issue that you have with a lot of congressmen is that they're raising money not just for themselves but for the party. And so, you know, and, and this goes for probably most congressmen, would a lot of people opt in or opt out because most of the money that they're raising, you know, you have like John Boehner raising $22 million, most of that's going to the NRCC. Um, I mean, how, how would this system impact that, and is there a way to address the fact that a lot of fundraising isn't about winning their own election, it's about helping the party? Well, I guess my proposal starts with having in mind the candidates who are thinking about, you know, winning their race each time and, and wanting to have confidence that they can be competitive. 
It also starts with the expectation that you would have um, candidates who now don't really have um, a difficult time being reelected and therefore may have uh, more expendable uh, dollars to contribute to others who would um, frankly have to get about the business of reaching out to their constituents in a more meaningful way than maybe they've become accustomed to because challengers would now have access to public funding if they go out and work hard and knock on doors and, and, and collect small donations and so forth. So um, I don't think that answers your question. I will, I will observe this. A few weeks ago, we had this um, provision that was passed as part of the Cromnibus that significantly limit, lifted and raised the limits on what high donors can contribute to the political parties. And um, if we had had a small donor matching system concept more in the, the mix at the time, people on the Hill were looking at, well, what do we do to make sure parties can you know, remain strong? Um, you might have had a proposal for a hybrid system of small donor matching for political parties, which would be small donors stepping up and saying, we'll, we'll support um, the funding of conventions and, and some other party apparatus, but we'll do it with small donation plus public matching funds, which ends up being a hybrid of where we're headed um, and where we're coming from. Because as you know, those were things that were publicly financed for a while, and then that's dropped off, and now it's going to be replaced by private donation. The beauty of a hybrid approach is you got the private donation coming from the small donors, from lots of everyday citizens. You have the public component coming from the matching funds. At the end of the day, the beauty of it is those parties and candidates, to the extent you have a system like that, are dependent upon the public a combination of the public being small donors and the public being public matching funds. And that's, that's a better place to be than where we are now. Yeah, I think, I think you know, I was talking before about how uh, a lot of the um, system, a lot of the way money works in politics is, is how somebody obtains power by being a broker of money. So certain members of Congress have a lot of influence over other members. You know, a freshman member of Congress doesn't have, they have more ability to raise money than they did before they were elected, but it's not necessarily easy. And somebody, and, they, and they're going to have a, a one or two tough races ahead. Uh, somebody who can get them that money has a lot of power within the institution. If you create other channels for, you know, both for challengers and even for those, for those freshmen, uh, the ones who all wanted to be on the Financial Services Committee uh, after they got elected in, in 2006 or 2008, for example, um, you know, you create other ways for them to operate, you kind of diffuse some of that internal power uh, in the institution as well. Hi, I'm Ann Haynes. I'm just an ordinary citizen, and I get mail that says, give me five bucks because the Koch brothers are going to give me millions of dollars, and I'm going, my five bucks? Are you kidding? That it just is incredible. But I really support what you're saying. And my question is, has Montgomery County done something like this? Yes. And, and how, s because I think I heard that at another session that I was about uh, reversing Citizen yes. United. In fact, I'm going from here to a forum in Montgomery County um, to talk about this issue. And Montgomery County um, did, in their last um, council manic session, um, pass a small donor matching system uh, bill, which there's great expectations about it. it has to be funded. I mean, you have to you have to get the county government now to set aside sufficient dollars to resource and underwrite this uh, system. But it's very similar, actually, to the design of our bill in terms of the matching, the multiplier, and so forth. It's all premised on what we've been talking about here, which is to encourage small donors to step in and become kind of lift up the campaign finance on their shoulders, and in return expect. Um, to see more accountability from elected officials. I will also observe, because uh, many of you in here are probably thinking about this, that um, Maryland's new Republican governor was elected with public funding um, and was outspent um, 
uh, quite significantly, uh, but put together a, a, a pretty good grassroots operation in part because he needed to, to qualify for the, the public funding. He said yesterday in his State of the State speech that he's going to um, propose putting the tax check off back um, onto the Maryland tax return to help fund this going forward. Um, we'll see what else can be done perhaps to broaden public financing to other um, uh, seats or other uh, uh, offices within Maryland because right now outside of Montgomery County it only exists for the governor and the lieutenant governor. But you're seeing examples in Arizona and Maine and Connecticut and New York City uh, that demonstrate this is not a fantasy. This can actually work and it has real positive consequences. A lot of good stuff happening in Maryland. We'll do one or two more, yeah. Do you, is, the, is there a chance that that would have any kind of impact the election of Governor Hogan in terms of Republicans? Uh, you know, you mentioned you have one Republican on your, on your bill. I mean, do you think that there's a chance to reach out to some more Republicans based on that or, or that he would, uh, you know, that there would be any impact from his election uh, wider, than, wider than just one, a uh, one time? Well, I think what it, it <coughs> It is, is it's just an example that you can point to, that the benefits of this, you know, to the extent any one party, and you, and you might assume that it's the Democratic Party because these reforms are coming first out of the Democratic corner, views this as a benefit for them. There are examples to refute that. And frankly, the modeling that we did of members of Congress and how they would fare under this proposal, if they were to participate, shows that um, Republicans are doing just as well under that scenario as, as Democrats uh, would do. So match that up with the fact that when you go out and poll people across the political spectrum, you see really common sentiment about this and the need for this. Um, among conservatives, and even when you talk about putting public dollars behind it through this matching fund. You look longitudinally at these surveys and you're seeing increasing support, um, not just across the whole spectrum, but um, from the conservative side of the spectrum. I think there's great potential there. I think that we need to have a conversation that crosses party lines. And you may end up in a room sitting across from someone and saying, we don't agree on anything substantively, but we do agree that everyday citizens deserve to have their voice heard in Washington, and let's see how we can collaborate to create a system that will do that. Let's do one more. Um, I'm Jared Soniker. Uh, I just have a quick following up on that last question a bit, because I think as we've seen within Congress and just throughout uh, other public discourse that laying out the facts that you, like these numbers that you're running does not necessarily, the facts themselves don't necessarily convince people a lot of time. There needs to be a narrative. So I'm curious what your strategy is for within your party and reaching across the aisle to convince uh, people to support this legislation when the donors that have been behind them for so long have every incentive to combat you and are going to be whispering in their ears while you're trying to talk to them as well? Well, that's a good question because we do have to build a compelling and sustaining um, narrative. The one I find the most appealing, because I think it kind of gets people's attention and it captures exactly what we're trying to achieve, is to say to any audience, somebody is going to own your government. It's not just going to sit there. Somebody's going to own it. And either it's going to be big money and special interest, in which case when it comes time to make policy, that's the direction that lawmakers will lean in. Or it's going to be you. It's going to be everyday citizens and the public. Let's go design a system that puts you in charge, that makes you the owners of your government again. And then you will have the rightful expectation, and it will oftentimes be met, that when those people go to make policy, they'll make it for you instead of making it for the special interest. 
fundamentally, that's what we're talking about. And there are many different avenues to ensure that government is being owned again by the people. And that's why we chose this name, Government by the People. I mean, Abraham Lincoln knew what he was talking about. Um, we need to get back to a government by the people, not by special interests, not by big money. It is such a fundamental tenet of our democracy um, that it's odd that we're having to make such an argument about it in a sense, but if we present this narrative um, to, the, to the public and we offer solutions, because part of the problem is everybody's lamenting the problem and the public doesn't necessarily feel like there are practical solutions. And I wanna, I wanna try working with people like the folks on this panel and others to begin moving the discussion into the solution space because that's where we'll find hope and with hope comes energy and with energy comes results and progress and I fundamentally believe that we can make this happen. It's not gonna happen overnight but it will happen in part because it has to. What other options are before us, right? Let's, I, I mean, I, I, I think that's terrific. I just wanna add a couple things, particularly about the issue of making sure that ultimately we will have to get to a much broader coalition in support of this. I mean, any kind of reform to the process, people have to feel like it, it, it's, it's a just system whether, whether their policy outcomes win or not. And part of democracy, you know, Larry asked about the vision of democracy. Part of a vision of democracy, you know, is, is feeling like you don't always get what you want, but you kind of have a confidence that the process that got you there was fair. And that's, and that's what you need to, what, what you ultimately will, um, will, will need to get to. And I think, you know, this issue years ago, when I was first involved in this issue, it was kind of an elite bipartisan issue where there was no grassroots interest, engagement at all. It was like the era of McCain-Feingold. Um, before that, the bill was called Goldwater Boren. You know, it was just like distinguished, esteemed uh, uh, men in figuring out what to do with no grassroots interest. Now, we have a lot of grassroots interest. It's a really great moment, but it's predominantly on one side. So we have to get to the point where we have, gra you know, it's not gonna be an elite bipartisan issue again. We're not going back to that, and that's good. It's got to be an issue that people feel in their bones, and it's got to be get to the point where what people feel in their bones that leads them to the Tea Party or that leads them to other kinds of, that, that makes them conservatives, makes them libertarians, or whatever, what they feel in their bones about the system and what other people who have sort of different underlying values or pref policy preferences feel, they realize like that there's a, there's a solution that is, is Make, will make both of them feel like they're at least heard, even if they don't always win. Can I just add one small comment about that? I, I actually see, if you follow the press and follow op-eds and the like, a movement in that direction. You see mm -hmm. you know, people from the Small Business Association saying, you know, this does not benefit us. Um, number of conservative voices that have come out, and certainly members of the Tea Party. I think it's, there's a time where we can start to expand the group of people who really care about these issues, and we really need to do that for sure in order to make it something that, that all the people are going to you know, get behind. But I think it's, I think it, I have hopes that it's gonna be sooner than you think. <laughs> <laughs>